You are listening to Veggie Doctor Radio, and this is episode number 185. Welcome to Veggie Doctor Radio. I am your host, Dr. Yami, board certified pediatrician, certified lifestyle medicine physician, certified health and wellness coach, author, speaker, mother, wife, and human being. I passionately believe in the power of diet, habits, and mindset in sparking and sustaining well being and joy in our lives. This podcast combines expert interviews and thoughtful monologues to explore plant-based nutrition, lifestyle medicine, parenting, mindset, and other exciting and fun topics. I hope that these episodes inspire you, uplift you, and equip you with the knowledge and tools to live your best life. Are you ready to get started? Let's do it. Welcome back, veggie lovers, to another episode of Veggie Doctor Radio. Today, I am talking about a food that I feel like we don't talk about enough. I don't hear people praising winter squash, and I believe that they deserve praise because I have just rediscovered them this year in my life, and I am literally obsessed. Like, I cannot stop eating winter squash i feel like pretty soon i'm going to develop keratinemia and my nose is going to turn orange like all the little babies that are eating lots of squash as one of their first complimentary foods but there's a lot of cool things i've discovered about them that i want to share with you and i hope that after you listen to this episode you will also become more interested in the squash and start to try more varieties and see how it can have a very delicious place in your life. Delicious, but also filling and satisfying. What are winter squash? So winter squash are considered a warm season vegetable that are harvested in late summer to early fall. They are part of the Kukur Batae. Oh my goodness, I knew I was going to not say that correct. Kukur family, also known as the Gourd family. But of course, technically, it's not even a vegetable. Squash are technically a fruit because they contain seeds and they come from the flowering parts of plants. But of course, culinary wise, we consider them a vegetable. They're related to melons, such as watermelon and honeydew. And what differentiates winter squash from summer squash is that winter squash have the hard rinds. The rind hardens as it matures and ripens. So when it is mature in winter squash, the rind is going to be thick. Summer squash have a thin edible peel. Winter squash have a thick generally an edible peel although if you follow people who are you know their whole aim is to reduce waste and to teach us ways to reduce waste they use the peels of winter squash so they technically can be eaten but can be very unpleasant in some cases such as in spaghetti squash and things like that it's going to be really hard and chewy Butternut squash, not so much. Delicata squash, I eat those. Acorn squash, a lot of people eat the rinds on that as well. And winter squash generally have a dense, firm flesh. So summer squash on the inside, very watery. And when you cook them, they get really watery and cook down really small. In summer squash, the meat on the inside, the vegan meat, of course, is thick and that's why it can also be very satisfying and filling what's really neat about winter squash is that they look cool they can look like almost anything they can have ribbed and bumpy skins irregular shapes and vibrant colors ranging from white to orange to green or even be multi-toned a lot of people use winter squash varieties as decoration during the fall season because they look really neat 
But just remember that color in nature also signifies different nutrients. So whenever you see all these different colors that winter squash can be, that means that there's different nutrients that are contained within that vegetable. Why are they called winter squash though? Because I told you at the beginning of this episode that they're actually harvested in the late summer, early fall. The reason they're called winter squash is because that rind is so thick that it means that they last several weeks to several months. And so it'll sustain you over the winter when there's generally not a lot of other vegetables and food may be scarce, especially in the past when we didn't have different ways of preparing food and didn't have grocery stores to go to winter squash. You could keep, keep it in a cool area and it's going to last for months before you can, you know, before you're able to cut into it and eat it, you can store it. So that's why it's called winter squash. Winter squash are generally cooked before they're eaten, but the plant is really cool because you can eat the leaves, the tendrils, the shoots, the stems, the flowers, and the seeds. You can eat the whole thing, it's all edible. Isn't that amazing? There's evidence of squash cultivation dating back to 8,000 BC in Mexico, Peru, and Eastern continental United States. And there's a hundred different varieties of squash. The per capita consumption in the U.S. is only five pounds per year. I hope that goes up over time. And one of the reasons that I've just been really surprised about winter squash is that I've always been under the belief, the understanding that it is a starchy vegetable. Remember, it's not even a vegetable, it's actually a fruit but that it's a starchy vegetable and that it is in the higher calorie density category. And I usually think of the more starchy foods that we eat, the foods such as like our whole grains and things like that, usually in the 400 and then beans in the 600 calories per pound. And as I was doing research, on winter squash and learning more about the nutrition facts and history and cultivation, I came across several articles that warned about winter squash. And I'm like, why are people, why are these articles warning people? And I was intrigued, like, do they have some kind of toxin? What's going on here? They were warning people not to eat too much winter squash because it is high in carbohydrates. And I was like, what? It's a vegetable. It has so many nutrients. And of course, in the articles, they're talking about sticking to non-starchy vegetables, which of course are wonderful and I praise. Think about things like spinach and leafy greens and your summer squash, which would be a more of a non-starchy vegetable category, how you should eat that. But that's not going to be enough to keep a person satisfied. It's not, you're gonna have to eat a lot of non-starchy vegetables. And even then, most people, if they're only gonna be eating non-starchy vegetables, it's gonna have to be a humongous volume, first of all. That's why cows eat all day long, because they're eating grass which is non-starchy. However, that's gonna be the first problem. You're gonna have to eat a lot. But second of all, even if you do eat all of that, you're probably not going to feel satisfied. You're not going to feel comforted. You're not gonna feel that feeling that you like of satiety if you're just eating non-starchy vegetables. So these articles are like, yeah, eat a little, maybe keep your carbohydrates low and then do the rest of your meal of lean protein, which we know what that means. What does, quote, lean protein means? It means meat. I think that these articles are completely misdirected and they don't even understand this category of food, which for those of you that eat a whole food plant-based diet, we know how a lot of people are carb phobic. If you eat a whole food plant-based diet, you're probably deriving 75% of your calories from carbohydrates. Remember that carbohydrates are important. All macronutrients are important in our diet. We shouldn't be eating just one macronutrient isolated. 
But whenever you eat whole plant foods, it's a combination of macronutrients. Yes, some of them might be higher percentage of carbohydrates. Some of them like nuts and seeds might be higher percentage of fats, but they all have carbohydrates. They all have fat. They all have protein in varying percentages. And they're all important for our health, but carbohydrates are especially important because they fuel us. They fuel our muscles, they fuel our brains, they help us think, they help us move, and they help us feel satisfied. So don't be afraid of carbohydrates, but then when you look at this delicious and amazing, like I really think that winter squash are amazing. I'm telling you, I don't know why I'm obsessed with this vegetable, but they are actually really low in calorie density. So I started looking at all the different winter squash types and I calculated that the average calorie density for winter squash is about 160 calories per pound. Vegetables on average are about 100 calories per pound. Fruits on average are about 300 calories per pound. And we know, of course, vegetables range. Some of them are low, like 40 calories per pound. You have to eat a lot of that to feel satisfied and full. But winter squash is like between vegetables and fruit, maybe even closer to your non-starchy vegetables. And they're way filling. I spent a couple of episodes talking about potatoes, white potatoes and then sweet potatoes, which are amazing. And I eat those and I love them as well. But I think winter squash, for some reason for me, they're even more satisfying than potatoes and help me, I don't know, I just feel good. I'm biased now, I'm just, I'm in the winter squash fan club. Per cup, Winter squashes range from 49 to 90 calories per cup, which is lower in calorie densities than potatoes and whole grains. So it's very misdirected. Don't be afraid of any of these vegetables, first of all. But if you're reading articles telling you to be cautious about eating winter squashes, but then they're telling you to eat all these other things, I really want you to think about that and question that, okay? Because honestly, This is a great category of food, and especially this time of year. I'm recording this episode in December because it's about to be winter. It's a great food to search out in your grocery stores. There's going to be a lot available, and you can do a lot with it. So let's talk about the common winter squash types that we consume in the United States. There's butternut squash, probably one of the most common that you see this time of year. Delicata, which I am literally in love with. Spaghetti squash, which is super cool. Kabocha, my very favorite. Hubbard, acorn, sweet dumpling, sugar pumpkin, banana, buttercup, carnival, and turban. That's just a few different types. There's more types of winter squash available, but those are gonna be the most common that you'll find. What about the nutrients found in winter squash? Well, first of all, like I said, they are low in calories. Please consider this a low calorie food. It's not gonna be as low in calories as spinach or lettuce, but it's very low in calories, especially like it gives you a big bang for your buck in nutrients and satisfaction. It's low in fat, high in fiber, my favorite F word. Super high in beta carotene. You remember at the beginning of the episode when I told you I was going to get carotinemia? Babies, they get carotinemia when they're eating a lot of foods that are high in beta carotene. Their little noses and faces around their noses turn orange. (laughs) And that is a sign that they're consuming beta carotene. And this can be tested. They've done studies to show that they can do different tests on your skin and they can tell if you eat a lot of fruits and vegetables because these nutrients are coming up, which may be one of the reasons why eating a diet high in fruits and vegetables is actually protective of skin cancer. Isn't that super cool? My mother, when she was pregnant with me, ate so much mango, which is definitely in in my top three of favorite fruits. She ate so much mango that her hands turned orange, like she was eating tubs of mango per day. Now my mom is one that can take fruit eating to an extreme, believe me. You never want to challenge her to a fruit eating contest because she will hands down beat you. So I'm sure she was eating 
like a ridiculous amount of mango per day and nobody else is going to happen to but this was a sign of how much she was eating she got carotenemia on her hands all right enough about beta carotene what are the other nutrients thiamine riboflavin niacin pentothenic acid, vitamin B6, folate. Think about all these amazing nutrients, especially if you're pregnant or you're breastfeeding that your baby's going to get. Vitamin C, calcium, iron, magnesium, manganese, phosphorus, potassium, omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids, vitamin E and vitamin K. They are exploding with nutrients. And you can tell because of their vibrant, beautiful colors the squashes usually are bright orange. They have these bright colors. And now for a very important message. Hey mama, if you are feeling frustrated about mealtime battles, worried that your child isn't eating enough or eating enough vegetables, afraid that your child is going to get some awful deficiency or disease because of the lack of diversity in their diet, I wrote a book that might be for you. A Parent's Guide to Intuitive Eating, How to Raise Kids Who Love to Eat Healthy is available in paperback, ebook, and audiobook through all major online booksellers. Did you know that most children are born with the innate ability to eat the appropriate amount of food to satisfy their hunger and support appropriate growth? Despite this, parents are still anxious and confused about how much and what to feed their children. In addition, many children are labeled as picky eaters or develop behaviors such as hiding and sneaking food. There's also a growing epidemic of dieting behaviors and eating disorders beginning at alarmingly young ages. In my book, you'll learn the five pillars of healthy eating, how to apply intuitive eating through all the stages of development, lifestyle habits that support healthy eating and body image, troubleshooting and problem solving for picky eaters, overeating and dieting behaviors, how to create and foster a healthy body image in your children, how exploring your own body image and relationship with food will help raise an intuitive eater, and what foods to offer your child at different stages of development. A Parent's Guide to Intuitive Eating, How to Raise Kids Who Love to Eat Healthy, available in paperback, ebook, and audiobook through all major online booksellers. Are you ready for a fresh approach to feeding your child? For more information, visit dryami.com forward slash book. And now back to the episode. Health benefits of winter squash are associated with these nutrients. So it may lower blood pressure, may decrease cholesterol, may reduce risk of heart disease, may have a beneficial effect on blood sugar, may decrease the risk of certain cancers, may decrease inflammation, and supports a healthy immune system. How much should we eat? The U.S. Dietary Guidelines recommend aiming for minimum three cups of vegetables per day. That is a minimum. So please take that as your baseline. And a serving of winter squash is about a cup or 200 grams. One cup of butternut squash has about 82 calories, two grams of protein, seven grams of fiber, 457% of your RDA for vitamin A, the beta carotene, and 52% of your RDA for vitamin C. Amazing, wow. So what are ways that you can incorporate winter squash into your meals? I mean, super easy. And you could even think about it kind of like a potato in some ways in how you can prepare it and use it in your meals. But you can roast them, bake them, steam them and boil them. You can microwave them. You can add them to salads and bowls, air fry them and eat them as a yummy snack. That is what I've been doing with delicata squash. I'll tell you that in a second how I do that. You can cube them and cook them into stews. You can turn them into a naturally creamy soup, which I'm doing today. I'll tell you about that in a second as well. You can mash them and season them. So delicious. You can get the actual squash, the whole squash itself, take all the seeds out, cook it, and then stuff it with grains and nuts. And oh my gosh, so delicious. Beans, put all kinds of yummy stuff in there. 
You can take the purees of these squashes and add them to your homemade baked goods. It gives your baked goods a delightful moistness, but you're adding all these nutrients. Just think about it. A cup of butternut squash, seven grams of fiber, and all of this vitamin A and vitamin C. I mean, what a great thing to add to your baked goods. And don't forget, you can eat all of the parts of the winter squash, including the seeds. So I've made it a habit since I've been eating so much squash lately to save all the seeds. I clean them off, I season them, and then I air fry them. Sometimes I add a little bit of oil and then I let my kids take them to school as a snack, but they're so yummy and crispy and light. They don't feel as heavy as your nuts. You can use that as garnish for the top of your soups and your salads. And what's really cool is whenever you have the seeds and they're naked, you can prepare them with whatever seasonings you want. So if you want to do a little sweet and salty or you want to do more of a barbecue or, uh, you know, a little bit of a taco seasoning, whatever you want to do, it's the palette is clean and ready for you to paint as you wish. So I've been eating all of the squash <laughs> recently, but let me start with delicata squash because it's so easy. And so delicata, delicata squash is long and it's like yellow and green and it's ribbed and um, you can eat the rinds. But what I do is I, you know, split it in half, take out the seeds, reserve the seeds, of course, because I'm going to cook them later. And then I cut it into half moons. I season with garlic powder, onion powder, a little bit of salt and nutritional yeast. Do not forget the nooch. And then I spread it on my little sheet for my air fryer and I air fry it and it gets caramelized and it like literally feels like a delicacy, delicata delicacy treat so yummy in fact the first couple times i did it i didn't even share because i didn't even have time to i ate the whole thing and didn't share it with anybody but was telling my whole family how amazing it was and they were all like well let me taste it and i was like oops sorry you can't taste it because it's all gone so i've been doing that usually once or twice a week and i love to either eat it by itself or i cut them up after i air fry them and cut them up into little cubes and put it into my salads. So that has been really yummy. And then today I am having a dinner party at my house and I have already started cooking. It's the first dinner party I have had since COVID invaded our lives. So it's been a while and I'm really excited about it. It's like a little holiday gathering, but here is the menu. I am making a creamy butternut squash soup. It's actually already made. I took inspiration from a recipe I found online, but of course I'm really bad about following recipes like step-by-step step exactly, so I took my own liberties. But here's the general recipe and you can easily do this at home. Remember that you can take any recipe and adapt it to your own preferences and just don't feel afraid to play. And when it comes to foods like this, play with it. How do you like things to taste? What's the texture you want in your foods? Play with it, make it your own. So this is what I did. I got the butternut squash and I peeled it, took the seeds out, reserved the seeds, and then I cubed it and I chopped up some onion and also pear and apple. And I put that on a baking sheet with some salt and I roasted it, okay? So good. Then I took all of that added it to my blender with veggie broth, um, mild curry powder, and cashews. Oh, and ginger. Oh my gosh, it's so good, y'all. Literally my mouth is watering. And then I blended that all up and it made this delicious, creamy, sweet, it has like, you know, the sweetness from the pears and the apples, but also savory butternut squash soup. What's cool about all of these squashes is they're pretty much intercha interchangeable. So you could use that same recipe and do it with pumpkin instead, or you could do it with acorn squash or whatever. So 
If you don't have a butternut squash at home, but you have an acorn squash, then try it with that, okay? So those are the two recipes, well, that recipe I made today and delicata I've been using a lot. And this year I've been experimenting more with spaghetti squash. Have you ever tasted a spaghetti squash? It's super interesting. The reason it's called a spaghetti squash is that after you cook it, you take a fork and you go along the flesh with the fork. I don't know what the word for that is, but you, you take the fork and you kind of dig at the flesh with the fork and it comes out in little tendrils like spaghetti noodles. And it's really neat. It looks like little spaghettis, right? Like little skinny spaghettis. And you can use that as you would spaghetti. So instead of spaghetti noodles, I usually put some spaghetti sauce and my sauteed veggies or my roasted veggies and eat that. Or the other day I actually used it with um, some peanut sauce with my stir fry. There's all kinds of ways that you can use it. But what's amazing is that it's really filling. It's really yummy. And there's all kinds of versatile ways you can use that. So try that out. And kabocha, my favorite way to eat kabocha is in a stew. And one of the restaurants here has a vegan uh, coconut kabocha curry that they serve over rice. Oh, it's to die for. Kabocha squash is also known as Japanese squash. And what I love about it is that it's really dense. And y'all heard me talk about the purple sweet potatoes. I like these dense vegetables that feel very hearty. So kabocha is denser and it's slightly sweet, savory, and just has that just mild sweetness to it. But it goes really well in those kinds of things like stewy things and creamy things. But you can also just dice it up and air fry it. It's really yummy. So those are the ones I wanted to talk about. I wonder what your favorite is and how much winter squash you've played around with. So let's talk about some fun facts about winter squash. China and India grow the most squash, but USA is the biggest importer of squash. The highest squash producing states in the US are California, Florida, Georgia, and Michigan. And the English word squash was derived from the Narragansett language word askuta squash, which means, quote, a green thing eaten raw. Squash was an important part of the native Mesoamerican diet. A fully grown squash can weigh up to 50 kilos, but the heaviest squash ever grown was a pumpkin. So have you heard of these contests where people grow these gigantic pumpkins? It weighed 2,118 pounds. And this was back in 2017, grown by a person named Joe Jutras in Rhode Island, USA. I can't even imagine what a pumpkin that weighs a ton looks like. That's got to be really big. And you can make a lot of pumpkin pie out of that. Native Americans used squash seeds to treat parasites. In fact, in my search around the internet, I did find some articles about people talking about how you can grind them into a powder. I don't know how that would work. I didn't look up any of the, the different components of squash seeds and how they might be anti-parasitic, but hey, I guess that's not a bad uh, side effect if you happen to have parasites and you're eating squash seeds. Um, the Sioux would cut pumpkins into strips, dry them, and weave them into mats used for sleeping or sitting. And squash rinds can be dried and used as containers. I said some of the squash rinds are pretty tough and they would be unpleasant to eat. Like the spaghetti squash, that's really tough. That's a really tough rind. So it's kind of cool that it was something that in the past had so many different purposes that you can eat all of the parts of it, but then you can use this rind, you know, you can apply it in a practical way to your life. And like I said, I went through and I calculated the calorie density of all of the different squashes. Butternut has the highest calorie density at about 203 calories per pound. But I was shocked that pumpkin has the lowest calorie density at 92 calories per pound 
which is really funny. You wouldn't guess that, right? Because how do we usually eat pumpkin? A lot of times the United States is in pumpkin pie, which is really high in calorie density because we're adding tons of sugar and fat to it. You don't have to make pumpkin pie. You can make pumpkin soup or cube your pumpkin and roast it and eat it on your salad. The cool thing is that just like potatoes, you can freeze winter squash. So if you wanna peel it and then cube it and then freeze it so you can have it for later or you can even buy it frozen, you can find often butternut squash in cubes that has been frozen and then you can use it all throughout the year. All right, veggie lovers, thank you so much for your attention today. And I hope that you're having a wonderful holiday season and taking advantage of all of the delicious, plantastic food out there. So I will catch you again next week and I hope you have a very plantastic day. Hey, veggie lover, I hope that you loved today's episode. Will you take a second and do me a huge favor? Please subscribe to my podcast so that you never miss an episode. You're the reason I'm here and I want to share it all with you. Thank you for listening and have a plantastic day.